Uh, my class has been playing Braid. All right. And we've all been having fun with it. Right. <laughs> uh, and so uh, we're here at Stanford Pre-Collegiate Summer Institute 2016 with Jonathan Blow and Nicholas Dwork. And I'll just ask you a bunch of questions. Sure. And uh, so what do you do for a living? I apparently make video games. I mean... I, I like that you said apparently, because I wonder if that's what you do for a living. What is the purpose with what you do for a living? I, you know, when you are in control of your own destiny, like you work for yourself as an independent developer or something, you could just wake up one day and decide to do a different thing, right? It's not like a regular job where it's, there's the list of things you're supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so far I wake up every day and I still want to do game stuff, but sometimes I wonder, you know. Um, but I just, I don't have, um, I don't have a very logical motivation, right? I don't, I don't say, well, I want this and that, and therefore, by some deep process of introspection, I must do A, B, and C. It's just more like, well, I'm just really interested in, games right now and uh, most of the creative ideas I have are in that direction so you know let's do that although you know lately I started making a programming language and that's been interesting and it's also it's been a very creative direction also but it's a very different kind of creativity so I don't know <laughs> this is what it is and uh, you must get a lot of satisfaction out of the games you've made uh, <laughs> okay, never mind. Do you I get mean, satisfaction out of it? Yes and no. It's weird because these things take a really long time. So Braid, which is not big as games go, took three and a half years. It's a long time. It's like getting a degree at Stanford, like an undergraduate degree, right? Mm -hmm. um, Witness took seven years. And we only just finished that. So uh, that's, uh, you know, so, so always what happens is you, in the beginning you have the idea for what you want to do and it's nice and beautiful and you're hyped and you're like, oh, this will be great, you know. Um, and then you start making it and it just takes so long to make, right, that um, the, the ideas become a little bit old and then you have new ideas for other games and you're like, ah, I wish I could do that right now, but I'm finishing this other thing. Um, so there is, there are moments of great satisfaction in there. It's just that the time is long enough that there's also a lot of moments of dissatisfaction about like, wow, if only I could do games three times as fast, I would be making way more stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, in one respect though, I think that that's something that technology naturally solves over time. So, uh, you know, th this past week I've been digging through the braid code and simplifying it. I actually made some little blog postings this week about what I'm doing. I sort of decided to just uh, notate everything I was doing since I woke up in the morning, you know, like, oh, I'm deleting this file and hmm. refactoring this thing and whatever, right? And a lot of what made braid hard to make is not true anymore, right? Like, computers had limited RAM. You know, we were shipping on the Xbox 360, which had 512 megs of RAM, which, uh, um, if you go far enough back in time, is an insanely huge amount. And today is a ludicrous amount. Like, you can't even install a modern operating system on any computer that has that little RAM, I don't think, right? And yet, you're supposed to make a whole game run on that and do things that no other game had done, right? Uh, so, this trickery had to happen there that I've been flushing out of the code. Um, just, uh, I mean, Braid's a 2D game. Right? So you would think, well, you can just program that. You don't have to optimize it to death because it's just 2D. No, I, I had to work pretty hard to make it run fast. Again, because processors at the time, I don't know how technical the audience is, but um, we're, we're there cares? with you, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there was, this, there was this thing that happened in CPUs, right, where um, there are many, many things that a CPU does to go fast, right? But one of them is out of order processing of various kinds. So, you know, if an instruction is blocked, say you read, try to read from memory, and like, that's not in the cache, so memory's slow, so we've got to wait a while for that result to come back. You know, they start executing things later, and there's a, there's a whole, like, dependency system on the chip where it understands which things it's allowed to run and which things depend on the result of this this instruction that's waiting, and whatever, right? So then when, when CPUs started getting more parallel, because that was the idea 
of, you know, like we can't really raise the clock rate anymore because we hit that wall. So, that, so we want parallel processing. The choice that was made for that generation of consoles uh, was, well, if we're going to stamp out this many chips on the die, something has to go. And part of what's going to go is all that out of order mm -hmm. stuff. Depending on what console you're talking about, it had very limited in order. But but so there were operations that you could do um, on a on a high end PC CPU and not even notice, and then you try to run out of console, and it's like, oh, I'm just waiting for memory all the time, you know. And then I have to think really hard about how to make this work. And then again today, that's there's just a, a long digression to to bring up an example of something that you just don't need to care about as much today. I mean, you do need to care about memory, but it's at a different order of caring, right? There's well, a lot why, of why are you doing this? Process. Why are you cleaning up right? Um, well, you know, if I make something, I like to think that it doesn't expire in two years, right? I mean, you can read a novel by an author that was written, you know, a couple hundred years ago, and we value those things, right? And um, if you're going to do that for video games right now, it's like, you're going to go to the video game museum where they have like an emulator of I see. whatever, right? And, and you can always preserve games that way. But if you want it to be a little bit more of a living thing and be available on new systems into the future, I see. then uh, you kind of need to be able to recompile it and maintain it and make changes, right? And so all the crufty optimizations and stuff. So optimization is great because it makes things go fast. And it's always bad at the same time because it makes things more complicated and hard to change, right? Mm -hmm. Like what optimization is, is doing something specific to a situation to go faster in that situation. But because you're more specific to that situation, you're less specific to other situations, right? So um, it's just to, uh, there's like some platonic ideal of like what the code is for Braid, and it's going more toward that mm -hmm. and more away from what had to happen in 2007. Is it going to get coded in Jai? I've, I've tossed around that idea. <laughs> um, it may happen. Okay. But uh, is that how you pronounce it, by the way, Jai? I don't really pronounce so, it. <laughs> I don't really pronounce it. So Jai is, oh, Jai, Jai is my pronunciation of Jonathan Blow's language. Yeah. I mean, the thing that always happens, especially in school, like I learned this habit back in school, right, is you come up with some idea for some project you want to do. And the first thing you do is come up with a cool name for it. And, <laughs> and, then, and then you just talk about, you always use the name, and like it's the name, and then colon, and then something describing it. Right. And, and then you never really finish the actual work. And you got excited about this thing. So I'm, I'm inverting that, and I'm just like, trying not to get excited about the name or the ideal behind it, and just do the work, because it's a great deal of work. Uh, it's working so far. OK. I think. Uh, the students here are advanced high school students, and they're trying to decide things like, where do I go to college? What do I do with my life? Okay. Do you have thoughts on how you might decide questions like that? Answer really good you know, questions I, like that. I remember back to when I was in high school, I had no idea about any of that stuff. Um, it was weird, because I, I, I liked computers when I was in high school, and then I decided to go to college and do physics for some reason, you know. And then I just started doing computers again, and then figured out that that was what I was doing. So, um, it's interesting. You have, to, you have to be careful. If you like video games, for example, there's a lot of video game schools, or schools that have video game programs now, and they're mostly terrible. Like... Stay away from those for the most. There's one or two that are good, but most of them are really bad. And and like what happened is it's like a market forces kind of thing. Ba back when I was in school, there was no such thing as any kind of education on video games, ever, because it was it was thought to be uh, not a serious subject. It was like below concern. You know, um, I went I went to college at UC Berkeley, rival of Stanford. Um, and the closest thing you could do was, you know, take a computer graphics class or something, right? And I don't even know. I don't know if Stanford has anything game-related. It probably doesn't because it's maybe too serious of a, of a university. In this program, they do. Yeah, okay. Um, anyway, uh, then at some point, so, so that was, there was this kind of conservatism that schools wouldn't 
do that because they wanted to be seen as serious institutions. And then at some point, somebody realized, wait, there's all these people who want to take get, get game-related education. So let's start a game program. And the first couple colleges that did that just got crazy amounts of students going there, right? And then it became a thing. And the problem is just that you have all these schools, and they all have new game programs, and they had to hire people to teach those things. And they all decided to hire people at once because it was the new thing. And any time you need to, as an industry, like hire a zillion people at once, they're not all the best people, right? They're not all really qualified to teach. Um, and in fact, very few people even appreciate how deep the subject of games is or how much there really is to understand for real. And so if you go to a place that claims to specifically teach games, just be careful and check it out. That's all I have to say. Um, More generally, like, how, how does one choose which path they're going to go on in their life? How did you? I, I was not that deliberate about it. I see. It. Just um, kind of, yeah. I, I, mean, say, I, I say I stumbling through it. It's weird because I programmed video games in high school, like little toy things or whatever. They weren't, like, something that you could, you know, get somebody else to play, really. <laughs> um, and then I went away from that for a long time. Like school was kind of took me away from that and then I had to find my way back to it. But then I also learned a lot of things in college that were good, like kind of grounding, you know. Um, so it wasn't bad, but I feel like I could have done it much more efficiently, mm -hmm. you know. And the, the thing is, you have the internet now. We didn't have that. <laughs> um, you know, it's much easier to communicate with other people and just figure out what's working for them and what they think is cool and... Um, so I sort of feel like you just kind of have to do that. And uh, I mean, what, if, if I were to go back and do what I was doing again, I would sort of know what I wanted to do, which would be something related to video games. Because that was what made me excited every day to wake up was video game stuff. It was just like, because of the world I lived in, I didn't believe that that could be a thing, right? So I would, I would have more faith that that could be a thing. And then I would, I would try to figure out what would apply to that. But um, I don't, I mean, t today's world is different enough that it's hard to give you a concrete, do this, mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. um, the, this is maybe a longer term piece of advice. Um, but like, as you're, if you're in school, like some people come up with a career plan, like I'm going to be in school, I'm going to go intern somewhere, or I'm going to graduate and then get a job at a certain kind of place. Um, I would say stay away from really big game companies uh, for either internships or when you're getting a job. And that's a little bit counterintuitive because usually if you're excited about games, some of your favorite games are probably some of the bigger games, right, made by like Blizzard or maybe EA or someone like that, right? The, the problem at a big company is, um, you know, it's a, it's a large functioning machine that moves forward on its, it has established a mechanism by which it makes things, right? And the best that you can do is sort of fit in there and help that mechanism work, which is a totally fine thing, right? Um, I'm not bashing that at all. That's how like all of society works. The problem is when you're a young person and you're still learning, you're limited by the speed of that mechanism, and you're limited in your learning by the role that they have for you. Whereas if you're just uh, doing independent projects, like I'm just doing whatever I want this summer, right? Or, um, or if you go to a very small team who's like working very hard to get something done because that's just how they work, and everybody's wearing 10 hats, and everybody's doing like way too much stuff, then you're limited by your own capability, and that's much better. You learn a lot more, and you, you know, you be, you become a much more effective person. So that's all I can say. Very good. Yeah. Um. Uh, we'll we'll hold, we'll hold questions to the end. So we'll, you actually then, let me let me add to that is okay. with a more immediate the more immediate thing. So what I just said is the same thing is true of classes. So if you go to a class, right, and you take a class about something, whether it's graphics or like games or something like that, um, 
the, the class is doing its best to suit the body of students, right? It has to be paced for those students, and instructors can do their what they can to try and like let people go a little bit at their own speed or whatever. I don't know how you handle that, but every everybody's got a different approach, right? You maybe give people optional stuff to do, or you know, but at some point, the you know a class is designed, or even a degree program at a place that's offering a degree, it's sort of designed for some statistical body of students to get through, right? And any individual person is somewhere toward one of the edges of that statistical cloud, right? So it'll always benefit you even in learning if you don't just do the classes, if you kind of spend some time doing what interests you. Maybe it's related to what's happening in the classes, but you just go off and do your own thing. Like all the, all the really successful people I know spent a lot of their time doing that. Actually, sometimes to the detriment of their grades. So I'm not necessarily encouraging that, although that's what I did. <laughs> uh, but, you know, use, like, use classes as, um, as, a, as a guideline, as a way to clue you in that, like, you're not ignorant, right? Um, you know, like a, a class will show you, oh, here's these concepts you should be aware of, right? Here's this problem that you might think is hard, but here's a way that people have found to solve it, right? And then you're aware of that solution. Doesn't mean you have to use that solution, right? But you're not ignorant anymore. But you can still go off and do something different. You don't have to like follow in the exact steps laid down by that particular class or that particular degree program or whatever. So just keep keep your creativity, I guess, and exercise it all the time. And that sounds like very hokey, like <laughs> random life advice or something. But it's really it's really the difference between people who come out of school and uh, really can hit the ground running and like do stuff versus, you know, some people go to computer science school, which is something I'm more familiar with, right? Um, some people get computer science degrees and still can't really program. You know, that happens even, at, it happened at Berkeley like a lot, right? Um, and it's not because Berkeley is a bad school, it's just uh, if you, if all you're doing is um, doing the assignments, right, and getting the grades, it's very easy to miss the pattern in the background, which is really the thing that you're supposed to be learning, right? Nobody cares, like, about exercise 5-3 in a particular book, right? They want to know, can you, can you deal with this topic generally in unexpected, unpredictable ways, right? That's too much rambling on that one question. No, that was great. Can yeah. someone let me know when it's 15 minutes to go? Jenna, can you let me know when it's 11.15? Um, I try to encourage my students to think unconventionally, to question conventional thought. This is a terribly difficult thing to do. It's hard to even recognize you're experiencing conventional thought a lot of the time. And you seem masterful at questioning conventional thoughts. God, that's... I wouldn't say that. Um, The thing that occurred to me to say to that, and it sounds a little too rash, but I'm going to say it anyway. Very good. <laughs> um, is all thought is conventional thought? Like what we know of as thought is a set of patterns that is societally learned and, and propagated and whatever. Um, And, I mean, human beings learn by imitation. Or to, it's not the only way we learn, but it's one of the primary ways, right? And so it just really, um, I think you can have thoughts that are more or less out of line with, like, the common agreed you know, whatever, consensus opinion or whatever, right? That's certainly easier. Um, 
but even then, so so again, going back to my days when I was uh, in high school and college, um, I liked to consider myself a non-consensus thinker, right? But at the same time, I had this element of like, well, I'm kind of copying this persona of being a little bit of a rebel, mm. right? And like not giving a crap about the system or whatever, <laughs> right? Um, and then it took a while to mature out of that into something that was more real, right? Something that was more like, okay, I don't, I don't need this other thing that I'm copying either, right? I can just have the reactions that I'm having and I can introspect on them and I can follow that train of thought somewhere or even train of thought is a weird thing because we all, I mean, we have thoughts, but they're mixed up with like emotions and bodily feelings and, and stuff and Western, I don't know, like, I don't know if it's because of Descartes or whatever, but in the West we idealize thought as just a series of ideas that leads from one to another. And that's not really how it is. It's like you have a particular thought because you feel grumpy right now or whatever. That feeling is part. And then there's other feelings like in the chain, right? So anyway, um, that's the thing. I mean, so, so to get back to the original question, ignoring the all thought is conventional thought, which may or may not be true. Um, just really, there, there's a certain talent to dropping what you think has to be going on, which is a societally learned thing, and just seeing what's going on, both in your mind and in the world, and just go from there, right? Like right now, right this second, what do I see? What do I feel like? What do I think? I don't even care what last night I thought I would be doing today. Really what is is here right now, and you look at that, and then you just do what you're inspired to do, right? Um, and that's that's a useful talent to cultivate. Do you have suggestions on how to cultivate it? How to develop that I, talent? Uh, all you can do is do that. Okay. Right? Um, because if you get, I mean, again, the, the, there's all these traps, societal and systemic traps that exist because they work. It's like there's a pattern where if you think about things a certain way, then you can function in society a certain way. And so that's why people do it, right? It's not a mistake. <laughs> it's not, um, but, but then if you can escape those patterns of thought, then, I mean, you can always retreat back into that pattern of thought if you find yourself in a bad place, right? So um, once you learn how to exist there, you can kind of go outside it. Are there, what, what are the upsides and downsides of thinking very conventionally within this pattern outside of it? Are there downsides to thinking unconventional? Oh, there's so many downsides. Okay. Um, like, how do you know if something's a good idea or not? Let's take something simple, like a game design idea. Like, I want to make a game, right? And I'm fed up with how most games are the same, so it's going to be different, and it's going to be interesting, and I have ideas A, B, and C about what's going to make it so much better, right? How do you know any of that's a good idea, right, versus just, I like it because it's my cool thing, and... Maybe that's even enough. Maybe it's fine if I make this game and then it goes into the world and everybody hates it and nobody cares, but I did a creative thing. But most people wouldn't be happy with that, right? So most people like their idea because they think there's something intrinsically good about it or because other people will appreciate it in some way, right? So then what do you... Um, you're kind of on your own. You have to develop the talent to measure the goodness of the idea. And that talent can't exactly be learned from, you can get hints from other people, but you can't exactly learn it from other people because we just said most people are operating, you know, in a more uh, predefined way. So it's very easy to do really dumb stuff. Like, you know, there's lots of like super creative artists or whatever, and you look at what they do and you're like, eh. How is that? I mean, I, I see I see how you would look at that and say, oh, that's interesting for five seconds, but yeah, 
I don't know. Um, it happens a lot. Bad ideas happen a lot in the world, right? And and it becomes your job to deal with that. Whereas um, when you're working within a system of thought, a lot of bad ideas have been tried and already failed and kicked out of the system of thought, right? <clears throat> so if I'm designing video games and I want to make a first-person shooter, right, the, the thing that's a first-person shooter today is not an accident, right? It became what it is because many things were tried and refined, and then I'm, I'm now making a new thing in this succession of this grand experiment of all these things that happened, right? Um, and again, that's a totally cool thing to do. It's not the way that I choose to do things usually. Eh, I do things like 30% that way. Um, but yeah, the, the point is just that the bad ideas have usually been kicked out of that. So then if you add your 5% of new ideas to the first person shooter, it's almost like you can't even mess it up that much because you're working with such a well, uh, well-refined uh, foundation, right? And you, you give that up if you're going to leave that area. <laughs> when you, you talked about, well, wh when did you decide you like Brave? Do you like Brave? Do I like it? Yeah. You're working on it still, so you want yeah, to... Yeah, I mean... Okay, so I so just when, when, when you put that much work into something, yeah, it's like it's not like you like it or not or whatever. It's part of your life. Right? <laughs> it's like it's like if you got married to someone, right? Um, and then whether it was good or not, at the end, at the say you broke up for whatever reason, I don't know. Um, maybe you still like that person, maybe you don't, but it was a much bigger thing than that, right? You just can't, you can't. There's no conclusion to be drawn. Okay. You know. But yeah, I mean I, I like I like the game, sure. I think I think it's really interesting, but that's also my experience of it is is a three and a half year long thing where a lot of things happened. That would be true regardless of whether it succeeded or not. Yeah. Do you like it more because it succeeded? Um, I think I do, and that is probably a personal weakness of some kind. Mm -hmm. Like I think of it, nobody had played it. I mean, like, imagine it's exactly the same game, but nobody played it for whatever reason, which is not actually... There is some alternate reality where that happened, right? Because the game... Which isn't probably too far away. It must have taken some luck to get to this point. You know, um, I, uh, I tried to get it on Steam at one point, way back in 2007, and they rejected it. They were like, we can't... We can't sell this kind of game. You know, it was before the graphics looked good and stuff, but you're supposed to be able to tell from the gameplay that it's a good game and whatever, right? Um, and getting on Xbox Live Arcade, which is where the game originally showed up, was a little bit like that sort of happened because one specific person there liked it, right? So if that hadn't happened, what, where would things go? I don't know. Um, so it's easy to, it's very, very easy to imagine that the game had a much smaller audience than it did, right? Um, and I don't know, I mean, I might feel like it's a worse game if that had happened, right? I mean, maybe I'm not as objective in my judgment of the thing as I would like to be. Or maybe I, maybe I would, I don't know. I don't know. There's pluses and minuses to everything, right? So a lot of people liked it, and, uh, however, when you work really hard on something, and then you see what a lot of people have to say about it, you also get a little bit... It's a hard thing. Um, because, again, you work on something for a long time, and you're really close to it. You, like, appreciate all these tiny details about it, right? And it goes out in the world, and almost nobody in the world sees most of those details. Maybe they have an impact on the experience, right? Like, maybe they have a better experience if they would have, but nobody... Then if they're going to tell their friend on the internet like what they like about this game, they're going to say something relatively crude about the game. 
Because that's just reality. I think that's true about any artwork at all. It's not a game-specific thing at all. But then it's hard as a creator to be like, you're almost like, why did I work so hard to make such a nice thing? But that's a little bit of an overstatement, but it's... Um, Yeah, I mean, you know, you put something out in the world and there's all kinds of people in the world. And you can't expect everybody, to, imagine there's some theoretical best, you know, you have some graph of like, how good is the experience for your of your game? I don't know, that's, that's not the right curve. Let's not bother with the graph. <laughs> anyway, there's, there's some theoretical, like, best possible experience that you could have. And uh, probably not that many people have that experience, right? And you can't reasonably expect that. And so then you kind of, maybe just like designing a class, you really try and say, well, I, I hope most people have a good experience with it. And then a few people will have an amazing experience with it, and some people are going to think it's terrible and whatever, right? Um, so that's just how a lot of things are in the world. And um, it's you can't expect anything different than that, but it's also hard when it's a work of art to see that happen, right? Yeah. That's all I'll say. For anything you made by yourself, is that true? Not completely, no. Uh, uh, the could I say the vast majority, like almost all of it you made by yeah, yourself? Yeah, I mean, the, the specific thing is um, I programmed most of it. Um, and I did program art up till a certain point, And then I experimented around trying to find people to do art for it. And eventually David Hellman came on and did most of the art. And Edmund McMillan, who did Super Meat Boy and stuff. Did, Another great game. Did the initial character designs and animations. Uh, and then uh, a friend of mine named Sean helped with programming at the very end, like in the last mm -hmm. month or two of the three and a half years, um, just to get some things in before we ship the game. Um, but it was sort of, I mean, it was it was a me doing most things, and then, you know, well, I mean, the art is a major, major component of the game, right? So David was sort of the main person on that. Um, so there's not really any any way that you could call it a one person project unless you're saying like one person really making it happen, right? Uh, um, did for how much of the game development did you work by yourself? Probably about a year and a half. A year and a half. Okay, so two years you worked with others. Yeah. Okay. Um, the witnesses more people, a large a larger group. A lot more people. people yeah. And so you had to go through the process of making a team, a larger team. And you had to work with people, many more people. Yeah. And so what was that experience like? What was making the team like? And what, what, is, what was working with these people like? Not very fun. <laughs> um, you know, everyone has different things that they like to do. Um, I want to do the creative parts, or maybe sometimes the technical parts of making games. I don't really want to like make a company. It's not a. It's not one of my life goals to like make a company and be in charge of a company, right? So, anytime, but 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 then I actually had to do that to make this game, and there wasn't really a choice because the Witness is a weird enough game that nobody would fund it, right? Nobody would. Um, you know, Electronic Arts was not about to give me a team to make that game with. And if they did, they would have interfered with it all to hell, and then they would own it afterward, and whatever. All sorts of bad things would happen. So, if, you know, I, at this time in history, to get something like that done, you have to make it happen sort of from beginning to end. Um, so it was necessary to hire a bunch of people into a company and run the company, and do like money management for the company and make sure things don't go out of business and whatever. And uh, I don't really like that stuff. Um, on the plus side, uh, around now, I'm actually going to look to hire somebody to do a lot of that stuff. So that's yeah. good. Um, give me more peace of mind to sort of turn back to the other things. 
Um, but it's also when a when a company is that small, um, you can't really think about it as a generic company yet, right? Uh, it's just more it's the individual people who you put together. So it's like okay, I hired a couple people to do three D modeling and people to program, and we were working with specific architects and whatever. And when it's ten to fourteen people, and you're always just dealing with individual people. So it's all about just the personality of that particular person and what do they like and what do they not like and just working with that every day. How did you decide, well, this may be too, maybe it was on a person-by-person -person basis, but are there qualities you look for in a person when you go to hire them? Well, these days, uh, yes. So... You first of all, I mean, you want to hire people who really want to be there, right? Doing that thing. You don't want to hire people who just like want a job, or want to work there to get into games so that they can then go work at Blizzard or something, right? That's um, because those people are, are. I mean, first of all, they they will not do that good of a job, right? Because they're not like in it the way that they would be if it was something they were really engaged with, right? But secondly, when you're trying to put together a team of people and that team is small, then you, you start to get situations that are poisonous. Like one person is just kind of being lame and, uh, you know, either not doing remotely a reasonable amount of work while everyone else is working hard, so then they, they say, why are we working hard? Or, Maybe they know why they're working hard, but they still they start feeling upset. Like, why is that person here, right? Um, or someone just can have a really depressive mood because they don't really want to be there, right? Like, if you don't want to be at a particular job and you have to go there every day, like, that kind of sucks, right? So um, what, what starts to happen is it starts to infect everybody else, and that's really bad. Like, you, you have to take care of that, right? And so when you hire people, you just want to be as far away from that situation as possible. And not necessarily in a, in a dumb way, like you don't want to hire someone who's just peppy all the time or something necessarily, but um, just people who really want to be there. And then, then the other property is just people who you don't have to micromanage, who sort of will take responsibility for their own situation and, and make uh, creative decisions within their realm of responsibility, right? And make those decisions well. Because, again, because we're a small thing. So a game like The Witness um, is big enough. It's way bigger than Braid, right? It's big enough that I simply can't have all the creative ideas for it, even if that was a desirable thing, right? It's not really a desirable thing because when people are making the visuals of the game, you want them to be creative about the visuals. So their creative input is going to happen no matter what, right? But then you want you want to hire people who are going to um, be proactive about that, right? Like, so say, hey, this area needs to be a forest. We don't want it to be a boring forest, right? <laughs> it's, it's supposed to feel a certain way, and here's what kind of puzzle is going to be in there. Um, think about what that looks like. Right? And get back to it. And, and that's an oversimplified situation because in, in The Witness we had many, many high-level ideas about what different areas of the game had to... There were principles that we were following, right? But it's like following these principles, what does this look like? How is it, how is it going to be beautiful and in what way? And, and how is it going to uh, stand, have its own identity compared to the other parts of the game? And you want someone who can do that, right? You don't want someone who just like um, only follows instructions, and then I then I have to tell them all the ideas, but I'm busy having ideas about some other thing, right? So that's very important. Did you make any mistakes? Did you hire someone you shouldn't have hired? Oh yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what did you learn from those mistakes? Um, this is just. It's the same thing you'll hear from anyone, I think, but be careful about who you hire. And when people are a problem, 
don't wait that long before taking care of the problem, either by firing them or whatever needs to happen, right? Um, because a lot of times, like, people like to be nice. I mean, there's some stereotype of mean bosses or something, but most people are trying to give a situation the benefit of the doubt and to, um, you know, oh, this person's having a bad couple of months, right? We'll see if we'll let it ride, and then eight months after that, it's like, well, it's going on a bad year, but, <laughs> you know, and... and um, that's just, like I said, that, that becomes poisonous. It affects everything, and so you want to take care of that stuff quickly. What does yeah. be careful when hiring mean? Like, how do you, how do you be careful? It's hard. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> right? You, it's almost like you can't be too careful, right? But then if, then if you put up a bunch of arbitrary blocks over who you hire, then you're going to miss people who are good. So there's, there's a wrong kind of being careful. And then what's, what's the right kind of being careful? I don't really know. I don't think anybody knows. Um, and it's different for every job, and it's different for every company. I worked at a company where we had a position available, and we had meetings upon meetings to decide how much, what text to put in the job description. It ended up being about two pages long. When you went to hire a game developer, you had a very interesting job description. Do you remember what it was? You mean from a few years ago? Or? Yeah. Um, be good at making games or something like that. That was it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, that was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that worked okay. That was uh, a good question. I think you risked a whole lot of your own money on the witness. I, I, I risked all the money that I had, yeah. And then and this a is lot, lot of somebody like, else's money on top of that. Braid, Braid brought in a lot. Yeah. And then you risked all of that, plus more. Yeah. And uh, that's a very unconventional thing to do. No, I mean, sort of, but not really. Okay. I mean, we're sort of living in an age where it's cooler to do that. So, like, Elon Musk did that with way more money than I did it with, right? Um, so did a lot of people we've never heard about because it didn't work out that way. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is probably true also. Um but again, it's just, you know, like what, I mean, I'm interested in doing stuff with games, right? So so this is, I guess, what I'm getting at. Like, in a, in a sense, you spent millions of dollars to make The Witness. Yeah. Why did you do that? Well, because, I mean, at any time in life, you might sit down and think, what do I want? What would I do the most? What would I do in life if I could do anything right now? You might have some idea, right? You might think, oh, I want to go take this amazing vacation, right, or whatever, but then a month later that vacation will be over. So it naturally turns to longer-term questions, like what, what is happening? Some people, like, want to raise a family or something. I didn't really want to do that. Um, but I wanted to make this game, right? It was the most interesting idea. So you imagine, like, a mathematician or somebody would say, like, I want to go do this research. I want to solve this particular hard problem or something, right? So... Uh, the witness was like that. It's like I have a particular set of ideas that's pretty different from what people usually do, and I just want to explore those creatively. And that, um, even if I didn't think that I was making a game to make money, I would have paid a lot of money to be able to do that in life, right? Um, some people buy a yacht or something. Like mm -hmm. I would pay to <laughs> have this opportunity to uh, to explore these topics, and I did pay quite a lot. But then, fortunately, you can sell the game after that. And yeah, so it's just, it's, I, I didn't really have anything else that I would want to do with the money, honestly. Um, I mean, aside from, you know, doing an effective altruism thing, and, you know, there's, there's you, whole you fields of thought you about You do that? It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, for some reason... I limit that to 10% of my income or whatever. I don't... Um, okay. You know, some people are just like, look, all the money I make is going to go to various causes that have been determined yeah. to be efficient, right? And uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm too greedy to do that, but most of most people are, so... I think of your games as a gift. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a weird thing because... Um, 
I mean, I'm definitely making them because I hope that people will like them and have a very good experience with them, right? Um, and I'm really, I'm just trying to get money back as a way of continuing my ability to make these things, right? It's not, I'm not trying to get high score on the dollar scoreboard. Um, you can tell that because otherwise I would have made a first person shooter or something. Um, <laughs> no, totally. Like nobody, nobody would make a game where you walk around a world and draw puzzle lines if you wanted to make money. It's completely ridiculous. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, there's always like what a question, what are you meant to do in the world? And should you, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't have wealth. You, you can take the start of that and, and explore that for yourself in terms of what thoughts you might have. I'm going to ask one more question because yeah. I can't help myself. Right. But then I'm going to step aside and let, the, let you have the floor okay. with the students. Cool. Uh, how do you know when you're done? You're creating art. Is it when you run out of money? Like, how do you know when you're done? No, usually you run out of money before you're done. <laughs> <laughs> That's, if you have good standards. I mean, that happened both times, right? Um, so, <clears throat> on the one hand, you're not, if you have reasonable standards, you're not ever going to be done because nothing's perfect, right? So you do have to a little bit, um, when I was a lot younger, I actually thought I was a perfectionist, right? before I ever made anything real in the world. Like, I had that kind of personality streak, right? Um, and then video games kind of taught me that you can't really be a perfectionist, but that that is still very useful. Uh, that perfectionist mindset is very useful because you actually can see the problems. Like, a lot of people can't see problems somehow, or, or they give them a pass or whatever, right? So what happens is I'm working on something. In the beginning, there's nothing there, and you're just making the ideas happen, right? And you might have some forebodings about maybe this idea is better, and maybe this part is weak and doesn't fit, but it's a little too early to make judgments because it's not real yet. And when things become real, they change, right? Because ideas in your head are... Uh, They just don't have as many details as the real thing in the real world is going to have. And so sometimes those details bring imperfections, but they also bring good things that you didn't foresee. Right? So there's initially there's this process of taking the idea and making it into a thing in the world. Once you've got a thing in the world, then you see all the problems with it, all the ways that it fell short of the idea that you have to try and, and supplement or fix. Right. Um, just merely technical situations, right? Like, this thing doesn't run fast enough on such and such a computer. Like, that's a problem. Um, wow, I didn't foresee that, like, it would feel so weird to move through the world and that I'd get caught up on corners all the time. I guess I need to do some robust collision system that I didn't plan for, right? Wh whatever. All that stuff, you make a big list of that, right? And as you go on and on through development, that list actually gets longer. It doesn't get shorter because every time it's like playing asteroids. Does anyone know what asteroids is now? Okay. <laughs> every time, every time you you blow up one of those items, it actually turns into like five smaller items, and then you hit those, and they turn into like five small. It's like a fractal refinement. So you end up with more and more things on the list, but they're smaller and less important, right? And the time when you're done is when they're all small and unimportant enough that compared to what you did do, you just don't mind, right? You're just like, okay, I'm going to delete the rest of the list. So this um, is a feeling. You're like... Yeah. I mean, there's things where it's like, oh, my God, if the game goes out and it's like that, I just... That, that can't happen. It'll ruin the game, right? Okay. Um, and, then, and then once those are gone, it's like, oh, that shouldn't happen because won't reach its potential of how good it can be. And then past that, it's like, well, I ideally would have liked this one part to be better, but I don't know. I just had a vague picture of that. And concretely, I don't know how to make it better. And that kind of thing is just like, well, you accept that. 
because what what else are you going to do, right? Um, so uh, now that's just the way it works for me. I don't know about everybody else. Of course. Um, Questions from the yeah, students? Yeah, sure. Questions again? Okay, so you mentioned earlier that um, if you were going to do a gaming internship, it would be a good idea to do it at a smaller company so that you would be pushed and have to think more independently, maybe? Yeah, you'd be given more responsibility, for sure. Right. Well, hopefully. Do you, do you think that that principle could be applied to any internship type? Like at any kind of company. Yeah. Probably, but I don't know for sure because, um, you know, I only really have experience in the industry of games. So I know what big game companies are like. I know what small game companies are like. I don't know what, uh, what a semiconductor manufacturer is like. I can't tell you. Um, so, uh, I, I would say that you could probably treat it as maybe very broadly true, but there's probably a lot of exceptions. There's probably a lot of big companies where it's cool because they try hard to, you know, like some big companies uh, are very deliberate about like, okay, we, we want to make a really good environment for interns so that as they sort of then go back to school and mature, they might want to come back and whatever, right? And companies that have done that well are probably good, you know, but that's not everybody for sure. Am I picking? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Is there anything you do to exercise your creativity? Um, you mean apart from making games and stuff? In general. Um, meditation is very good. That's not exercising creativity, but it's um, it creates space for creativity to happen. Like if you're very, very concerned with all sorts of pragmatic details about what's going on today or like what somebody said about me or something, right? That just takes all your mind space and creativity can't happen, right? Whereas if you get rid of all that, then there's just ideas that have been waiting around and they kind of bubble up. That's, that's the most effective thing that I know. Uh, yeah. uh, so given the emphasis on individual psychological desires and also the fact that some people just can't really see the, like I said, the deep nature of video games, how do you compensate for the desires of your audiences when you're designing a game? Do you like look at psychological studies or a certain target or what, what's the uh, path to take? I just don't think about things that way at all. Okay. I mean, some, some people do. I, um, I always just have an experience that I think would be interesting or cool or something. And then I just design a game for people who also will think that that's cool. And I don't care that much about what their personalities are like or how old they are or where they live or anything like that. Um, but again, I'm not a very business focused person. I think if you're going to be very business focused, then you probably take a different approach. Probably. Uh, yeah. You've created many very creative puzzles in all your games, so are there any sources of inspiration you draw your creativity from, or that you base your puzzles off of? For puzzles specifically? Or any kind of obstacle that we're meant to overcome in the game. Yeah, the way, the way that I do puzzles is... Um, when I started doing it, it was a little bit unusual for the game industry, but uh, it's kind of catching on among some people, where it's more like um, it's more like a mathematical exploration, or a, mathematical is even the wrong word. It's um, like I don't sit down to design a game and say I'm going to come up with hard things that people have to figure out. And, and then they'll feel smart or whatever, right? I sit down and I say, well, hey, I've got this game where you could play with time, right? And I program the basic thing. And then what, what can happen? Like, how can I play with that? Like, what interesting situations could happen, right? 
And then I just play with that for a long time. And I come up with the most interesting things that could happen and then build puzzles around them. So like one of one of the earliest things in in Braid that worked that way, like the sort of the first world that you play in Braid is just rewind, and then after that you get things that like don't rewind. And for that, I was just like, well, what happens if I make things that don't rewind? Well, you could like phase shift stuff because you're rewinding some things and not others. So you can change spacing between things. And then you can make a puzzle out of that. But it wasn't like, let me make a hard thing. How do I put a hard thing here? Oh, I guess you could change the spacing. It was more like, isn't it cool that you could change the spacing? And then let's let's illustrate that by making a situation that you can't solve without changing the spacing. So the motivation goes in a different direction, right? And that was something I learned to do in Braid, and then I did most of the time in The Witness. So um, basically all the puzzles in The Witness are that way, and that's one reason why they're a lot easier than Braid usually. Like Braid has a couple easy things, but for the most part, they're medium to hard. Whereas in The Witness, there's a bunch of stuff where you just walk up and you could solve it in like five seconds, right? And then it sort of ramps up and then it gets easier and harder and easier and harder. And the reason is just because it's more about the flow of ideas versus making a difficult situation. Yeah. It was my understanding for the witness that you chose to write your own engine. Um, my question is, I guess, what, what led you to doing that? And then what was that experience like? Um, okay, before I say anything, <laughs> uh, I'll just iterate that for beginners, most of what I'm going to say is not really, it's always true, but when you're starting, you probably should use an engine because it'll save you a ton of work and you can just start, start getting things done, right? However, um, like part of having this perfectionist attitude and making things as good as you can is having the ability to fix problems. And when you use someone else's engine, you give up the ability to fix problems beneath a certain level. Like, oh, the frame rate hitches when we stream in part of this level. If you're running down this hallway really fast, it results in a kind of a poor experience. Maybe we'll email someone at Unity and pray that they fix it, and they probably won't, right? Or sometimes you can work around that kind of thing, but it, it ends up being very hard, and it ends up feeling very uh, um, not solid, right? And then the other reason, so the same reason why I was playing around with the braid code this week is because, um, you know, I, I want... I want to have a portfolio of like my designs that I can make available to people at any time in the future. And you know, if you make a game in Unreal or Unity or something, uh, you probably don't have the source code. Um, even if you did and you wanted to make the game available 15 years from now on some platform that you don't even know, like what is it? I don't, I don't know what computers going to be like in 15 years. Now, uh, even if it's legal for you to use the source code then, which it may or may not, depending on what the agreement is. Um, now you face the difficulty of porting this enormous engine that is way, way bigger than the, like the, the engine for the witness that we built is much smaller. It's like a 10th or a 30th the size of like Unreal or Unity in terms of lines of source code. And the reason is because we're doing exactly what we want to do when you build when you design an engine a commercial engine you have to do what everybody wants to do um, and it's just a much harder problem actually right and so because I want to make the game available on new platforms and I want it to not rot um, I think it's important to have full control over that um, let's go in the back uh, do you think you're better off without your sense of perfectionism? Like, you can let things go? Do you think that helps you? The sense is still there. <laughs> um, it's just that I don't, uh, yeah, I don't, um, I understand that it's not possible to make everything perfect, right? And 
that's, um, I mean, I think it's definitely better in some sense because I wouldn't have been able to finish either of these games otherwise. There are definitely things in both games that are not perfect. And even if I worked double the amount of time on each game, there still would be. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's necessary as far as I'm concerned. Uh, however, if you can make games faster, then maybe you can extend out your picture of what's perfect. So a game just came out a couple weeks ago called Inside. I don't know if any of you played this. Uh, it's on Steam and on the Xbox One. It's a three hour long platformer, so it's short. Uh, it's very content focused about what situations you encounter. Uh, the company that made it took six years to make it, to make a three hour game. And you can feel that when you play it at all times. It's the most polished game ever made. And yet still, I'm playing it being so impressed about how well put together it is. I've never seen anything as well put together as this. I start to notice things that I wouldn't have done that way, right? Or that, that, I, that would have bugged me. Small things, but they're there. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's not possible to be perfect. Um, especially the more complex of a thing that you're doing. So just something to learn. But don't let that be an excuse to do crappy things. Uh, back there. We haven't done much on the left. Yeah, what are your opinions on a game like Undertale? Did you call that like a copying a Rebel Persona like you said earlier, or like creative thought? I don't know. I, I mean, I can't assign much to other people's motivations or anything. I mean, um, I think it's cool. Um, I think uh, the dude who made Undertale is, is pretty young, right? Um, and that's already by itself interesting. Is he like 20 or 21 or something? Or, yeah, I think so. Um, like that would have been almost impossible when I was 20. Um, it was certainly so hard that it didn't really happen, right? That you could make a game and it could be a hit and a lot of people would enjoy it, right? So that's the interesting thing about Undertale to me is that you kind of, you don't have to, wait until you're a 37-year-old adult to do something, right? Um, you can do something right away, and it'll, it can have a big effect. World of Warcraft. What do you think of World of Warcraft? I haven't played it in a really long time. The thing is, they patch it a lot, right? And we release a lot of expansions. So I haven't seen it since, like, 2008. Okay. At that time, I didn't like it very much. Um, You're quoted as calling it unethical. Yes, but <laughs> since then, way more unethical things have happened. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> what was unethical about it? What's happened since? Well, it, you know, there's this kind of design for addiction thing that that is more directly um, personified these days by like iOS games. I would say iOS games are much more unethical than World of Warcraft. Um, because there's not really a game there in most of those, right? It's just like you take this loop around, you, you make state changes happen in the world, like by building a building or hiring a little character or something, and that takes some amount of time, and you pay money to skip the thing, and that's it. All these games are just trying to build these treadmills, right? That's actually a technical term, a treadmill, which sort of tells you that people are aware of this. Um, Treadmill is the illusion of progress without anything real happening, right? So in World of Warcraft, the treadmill is you go up levels and you fight monsters that do more damage and that have more hit points, but you have better weapons, right? All our, most RPGs do this, right? So you're still sort of doing the same fight that you did. It's just the numbers are bigger, right? Um, and there, like over time, small changes tend to happen but there's smaller changes than that, right? Um, so what iOS kind of games did is take this concept of the treadmill out of RPGs and apply it to just like your spare time or whatever, or like how pretty the sprites are on the screen or something. And, um, and then the thing that makes it even more unethical than in the past is that the business model is to exploit the small number of people who are addicted to the game and will pay like hundreds of dollars a month because 
of whatever psychological thing makes that happen, right? So most people don't pay anything, and then a small number of people like lose their life savings playing these games. It's not cool at all. <laughs>